fait. and welcome back to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We're live in the Think Tech Hawaii studios today and we've got Matthew Rosenquist joining us today, uh, cybersecurity strategist, industry evangelist. Matthew's got a, a lot of titles and um, I'm, I'm really happy to have you join us today, Matthew, welcome. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. Awesome, I really appreciate it. So what we thought we'd do since this is our, our last show of the year, um, is take a look back at, at what technologies have, have sort of permeated the physical security industry and had the most impact uh, maybe in the past year or so, and to to me, the, the the sort of the first one that came out was this this issue of facial recognition. Um, it, it kind of bleeds into privacy too, but um, facial recognition we we really didn't get in front of the privacy discussion there as an industry, and now we're seeing it outlawed and things like that. Where you know we felt it had a lot of potential for law enforcement and things like that. So, what do you what do you think about that one? Yeah, that was kind of a big miss, really, in the physical security industry. The cybersecurity industry, having to deal with data breaches and whatnot, mm -hmm. was very sensitive even coming into this year. And we're seeing even more regulations. California is uh, leading a, a pack of states uh, that are enacting even stronger privacy uh, regulations, very similar to what Europe's doing. So privacy is important. However, there also are tremendous benefits on the physical security side for facial recognition. You had mentioned for law enforcement. Absolutely. And we're seeing other nations around the world using facial recognition and tying into different even private systems to help with um, either deterring crime or tracking criminals down after the fact. Uh, but there's also use cases in retail, for example. Mm -hmm. You can track people, what they're doing, what they're looking at, be able to give them a better experience, right? Um, be able to find that customer who's looking for a, a sales associate and get to them faster. Uh, or figure out what products are going to best suit them. So there are some benefits. However, we can't ignore the, the privacy concerns, especially if that data is being tracked and we're starting to tie more and more information mm. into whatever data that we're capturing. Yeah, that um, that leads me right to. So I pulled up um, the Security Industry Association recently published the, the the top mega trends for the industry, and number one on that list was the cybersecurity impact on physical security. And I know that you recently just penned a document looking at seven of those top areas that are uh, are, are particularly you know have have two sides of that coin, you know benefits and then risks, of course, with any technology. Um, Let's pull that graphic up real quick and see if we can take a take a look at, at, at the ethics and accountability piece. And this one's really about AI, your first one. But in that facial recognition piece, you know, that that using of that uh, image of someone or whatever, you know, I think law enforcement's fairly clear in the United States. The rest of the world may be not so clear as to how and when they could use those images or what they could do with them. And then, of course, if you start processing those images with the power of AI. So, um, Matthew, did you see a lot of that um, starting to happen, or is it is it still a thing where we, you know, machine learning? We're talking about it, uh, but not necessarily using it or not using it appropriately everywhere. Oh no, it's going lightning fast. Um, <laughs> China, <laughs> it absolutely is. China is probably the leader in this. So they're okay. deploying several hundred million cameras wow. uh, across the nation. And the stated, I mean, they're very clear about this. They want to be able to identify people on the street when they're going from here to there. They want to be able to track people um, and protect them, right? It's, it's, it's also under, uh, under that umbrella. They're doing it for, for certain reasons. But being able to track a billion plus people anywhere they go in their, in their major cities is really what they want to do. And you're talking, you know, one camera for every couple of people uh, in China, and that number is actually going up. So a lot more cameras are being deployed. They're using facial recognition at scale. They're developing the systems to be able to handle it at scale and improve the accuracy. And wow. again, there's great, great benefits, mm -hmm. but also, you know, from, from our perspective in the U.S. and in Europe, that type of tracking constantly can seem a little pervasive and mm -hmm. kind of infringe upon, you know, our liberties. For them in China, it isn't that, you know, the case. Yeah. 
And that maybe leads us to that next piece that you mentioned, Terry, this in the, with the insecurity of autonomous stuff, right? So if we've got powerful enough machinery to follow us around and perhaps, you know, perhaps invade our privacy or perhaps make mistakes about who we are or perhaps decide that we're not allowed in some place all on its own, that is a bigger power issue that uh, maybe we're going to have to deal with in the future. Maybe it's not happening yet today. I'm not sure how much of the uh, machine learning tools there are. Are they giving people scores, for example, in China already and, and allowing them to do things or not do things? Like, like we have a no-fly list in this country, right? Maybe there's a, you know, you're, they're not allowing people to leave the country for certain reasons. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, actually, they do. They've got a whole social network. It's actually tied uh, almost to gamification, if you will. Wow. Uh, unlike the United States, where we've got uh, like a loan rating or FICO scores, mm -hmm. in China, they don't have that. It's actually your, your social rating wow. and how good of a citizen you are. Ah. So they track. The government tracks, um, you know, how much time uh, that you spent doing volunteer work or whether you've donated this week or what kind of groceries you're buying. Is it healthy? You know, are you wow. are you paying your, your, you know, your taxes? Are, are you going to the poli right political parties? Are you connected with the right type of fellow citizens that's mm. also supportive of the government and helpful to their community? Mm -hmm. And if you're not your score goes down. <laughs> if you connect or friend with somebody that maybe has radical views, mm -hmm. sure. your score goes down. This could impact whether you get a visa to travel. This could wow. impact whether you could even book a first class seat on something. Wow. And so there's wow. a lot more ramifications. Now tie this in to all the cameras and them tracking where you're going, right? Did you go to a rally that perhaps was not pro-government? Did you go, you know, somewhere that that was maybe a volunteer effort? Maybe your score goes up. So there's a lot more with technology that they can use to grade and encourage wow. certain behaviors mm. and discourage others for their populace. Interesting. Yeah, I was just reading somewhere that they it's been in recent years, but they surpassed us. I think China had. 200 of the world's supercomputers and we're down to like 150 or something like that. I was kind of surprised to to know that we were no longer the supercomputer power of the world. About 10 years ago, they started pouring billions of dollars into their national technology, specifically around computing, supercomputers, and even uh, chip manufacturing, production design. Uh, there are several large cities and regions that are powerhouses in these spaces and have been actively um acquiring uh information so that they can be competitive on a world market yeah you talked um, a little bit in your article about the data lakes and you know we're it's interesting how from a u.s perspective i'm thinking this stuff is more in the future or, or things we have to consider for our future whereas other countries um from a technological perspective are already doing these things and already implementing them so maybe it will be learning lessons from them whereas it's i think everyone's always tried to borrow lessons from us in the past yeah, um, I think we're a little bit behind, especially in the privacy space mm. and quite a bit in the transparency space, ah. because the data that we're talking about actually is already being gathered uh, to a great extent. And it's the laws and the regulations that are coming in. And now the data breaches as well that are highlighting that fact. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at Cambridge Analytica and they were actively promoting the fact that they had between four and 5,000 pieces of data for every American. Mm and that they could take a segment and use that data to figure out how to change someone's opinions, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be on voting or a product or, or a person, things of that sort. And four to 5,000, that really isn't that much. Uh, if you look at your browser, your social media, uh, they're tracking a lot more than that just alone. And what we're having with these data lakes is the aggregation across all these platforms to be able to track millions of data points for wow. people. Everything from your health to your purchases to where you go to who you talk to, um, everything. Yeah, I've um, often said that, you know, we're we're not, you know, as an industry, security, the physical security industry, electronic security is not, we're not really big brother, but we're sort of big brother's little helper. And in that a lot of these devices that we put out there are capable of collecting this information, you know, be it video that things are gleaned from or uh, where where you go you know access control your your behaviors um in the uh, uh 
with the um, turning on and turning off of systems. Maybe your alarm, your alarm system at home probably is a good measure of how often you are there and not there, things like that. Um, you talked mm -hmm. a little bit about the use of connected devices and the, the information that can be, I guess, um, arranged from knowing things from multiple systems. And then we're getting more and more power for doing that. Um, do you think the security industry needs to get to get a better voice in trying to help consumers or businesses, even in government, to understand what capabilities we could lend in a positive way? Or are we still, are we gonna wait for regulation to tell us what to do? I guess it's kind of the other side of that coin. Well, unfortunately, regulation, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, where a lot of this is being driven from, is doesn't keep pace. It simply doesn't keep pace with, with the rate of innovation. Mm. And so if we wait, for regulation, we're going to be in a situation where it starts to constrict uh, technology, mm. and that reduces yeah. the benefits that we can all, ben you know, uh, gain from it. So, and unfortunately, right, privacy, we're kind of in that space now. We yeah. didn't look ahead. Yeah. We didn't proactively put controls in place. Yeah. So now the technology industry is is reeling from that, and there's we're taking a few steps backwards. But that is not the way we want to do it. For any area, whether it be physical or cyber, we need to be able to look at the potential issues that the industry is not addressing that don't align with the expectations, either current or future, of the populace, of society, mm -hmm. and get ahead, right? We want to be able to build those best practices. We want to be able to have industry standards that aligns with where people are mentally and emotionally. Because if not, then you get anger, you get fear. And mm. when that happens, people go to their government and say, hey, force companies to do something. And we yeah, don't want that. I think, you know, we, as a, the security industry, I think always was always a trusted industry, or at least I hope we were a trusted industry. I feel like we were. And not being out in front of cybersecurity with our devices that we deployed, and then not being in front of the privacy discussion. Do you think the e erosion of trust is, is something that our industry was impacted uh, by in the past year or so? I think it was. But again, yeah. I think if we look at those those overlapping circles between physical security and cybersecurity, mm -hmm. um, I think physical security still has a lot more trust than the cyber side. Okay. And it may have to do with the amount of information and data uh, that's currently being captured on the physical security side, which is much less then on the cyber side, you know, your IT, your infrastructure, all the devices you have and everything else. Yeah. So I think physical security is in a much better position from um, regaining some of that trust. I think there was some trust lost when you walk into a uh, store and there's cameras there and they're tracking you and you feel kind of weird and you're wondering, are they taking pictures of your kids? What are they going to do with that? Because people are now more aware, right? What are they doing with that data? Are they sharing it? Are they storing it? Are they tracking me? Um, and now we've got you know web browser settings where I can remove some of that, and and I can go into a company online and send them an email to say, hey, you know, remove that data. Can we do that on the physical side? Mm. We haven't really breached these kinds of questions. Sure. Nor do we know what data is being captured. Mm. So that becomes a problem moving into next year and the year after. Mm -hmm. Because all the cybersecurity requirements that we're seeing, like the California Privacy Act that's coming up, that's gonna be mm -hmm. enacted here in the beginning of next year, companies have to tell customers you know, what data we have and give them the option to have it removed, to not sell it. Mm. Will that bleed over to the brick and mortar environment with physical security? It yeah, might. It's interesting, you know, I know that, um, Part of GDPR, I believe, you have to have the ability in your surveillance system to be able to remove someone's uh, surveilled video at their request. And um, I don't know in the U.S. if we're going to have policies like that. We have the tools to do that, but I can't imagine the infrastructure that if you've had people walking around a facility all day, visitors, guests, whatever it may be, and they want to be removed, how much time that may take to do that. Um, it's going to be an interesting, an interesting, uh, uh, I guess, thing to watch as this as the legislation and the laws develop around this, how it gets handled in the U.S. versus what they've done in Europe. Yeah, and we don't want the pendulum to swing too far back, right? We want to find that optimal level. And if fear is running rampant, 
then the legislators are going to feel that and they're going to drive very hard pressing uh, kind of regulation that will limit innovation. And we don't want that, right? Yeah. We want innovation. We want our tools. We want all the benefits, but we do have to be cognizant that there comes, you know, it comes with risks and then proactively address those. Yeah, so we want to maximize yeah. the benefits and minimize the risks. There you go. Um, with that, I tell you what, let's take a short break and pay some bills and we'll be right back in just a minute with Matt Rosenquist. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. We're chatting with Matthew Rosenquist, cybersecurity evangelist, cybersecurity strategist. Uh, Matthew, we were talking about um, these um, devices. We were talking about privacy. We're talking about some of the trends that impacted the U.S. and, and are going to be impacting the U.S. Um, there's another one that, that you brought up in this paper recently about these next billion cyber criminals, you know, the, the folks that are coming online. I was wondering... You know, that scares me a little bit that there's maybe six billion users and a billion of them are maybe criminals, right? That, that, the odds aren't too good for a guy like me at that level. But the, um, how many do you think came on last year? And I just don't sort of have these numbers at the top of mind, but surely hundreds of thousands of new users came on and, and perhaps joined these criminal ranks that are, um, you know, they're making some money. They're, they're um, you know, they're, they're improving their quality of life and they maybe don't have the same ethics we do. Yeah. Um, I mean, right now we've got about, what, 4.4 billion people that's connected wow. on the internet. Wow. In the next couple of years, we're expecting another billion and then another billion, obviously, to follow that. So within the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more people. And we're at a point of convergence here. Most of the well-developed countries out there, uh, most of the people are actually on the internet. So where we're going to see this growth, the next billion people are going to be in developing countries. Ah. Now, you and I, I mean, we live a privileged life. Let, let, let's be honest. Yeah, for sure. Half of the planet, sure. actually more than half of the planet, make less than $20 a day. Wow. So it's Thank hand God. to mouth, okay. right? So they're looking to put food on the table, and it's a struggle. It's the hustle. you you got to hustle every day to survive, mm. right? And so when we look at this next billion people that come online, it isn't for entertainment. It isn't just to be able to communicate. It is an opportunity for them to make a better life for themselves, mm -hmm. right? Many yeah. of these people are, are you know, locked into a, a local geography, so you're limited to the number of jobs and, and you're competing with everybody else. Okay. When you're now on the internet, you can reach out and you have opportunities around the globe. Okay. So this okay. is where <clears throat> you get cyber criminals thinking I've got a whole new population to help me do my dirty deeds. Mm. And you've got things like ransomware as a service. You've got um, uh, terrible like robocalling and all sorts of other types of fraud out there. Um, you know, spam and phishing. All these activities don't necessarily take a high degree of technical savvy, okay. but it does take yeah. a lot of work. And when you've got this entire new community joining the internet that, that are hungry, potentially literally hungry, they're willing to take those risks. Mm. And so we're seeing the cyber criminals create packages, ransomware packages that take zero expertise and they will run the entire backend infrastructure. All they need is somebody that can hustle, join social media clubs, groups, befriend people to send them links, to get them to download something, to get them to open a file. Mm. And then they will get a cut. And that cut, which may only be a few percentage points, may quadruple what they're making 
every day. It could be life changing. Yeah. This is what we're facing. Mm. And this is what I'm concerned with moving to the next billion because those people, you know, just, just because they come from a disadvantaged economy does not mean they're not very smart and imaginative. That's true. And it's those true. are the kind of criminals you have to worry about because yeah. they will find a way. They are persistent. They are motivated. They are creative. That's what we're going to be facing. Yeah. Scary for, scary for the rest of us. Is, um, do you think that uh, the, the electronic security world will be, you know, when then we, we talk about like smart cities and the deployment and, and being able to track people, you know, when we can figure out that these guys are never left the house, for example, but they're depositing money in their bank account, you know, maybe, maybe the, the physical piece will have a, 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 a be able to help us identify some of this behavior that's, you know, questionable. Maybe, right? I mean, we're going to have to find the new case. Um, I'm more worried about the physical side being victimized. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? If I want to use to, to, to hire an army for a few dollars a day to come in and do a denial of service uh, against a physical site, their security, their communications, if I want to hire some people, 50 or 100 people for pennies a day to do vulnerability scanning, on your networks, on your software, on your interfaces, or to compile data about your customers, your executives, your users, or your products, it becomes very easy. Mm. Yeah, I saw um, UL recently published some um, sort of like, I think there were five or six standards for like IoT devices. And I know that we've been working to get the security industry. For me, I sort of wanted our devices not included necessarily in IoT, but I think that's a a battle we've already lost as well. I think we're we're considered part of that. It's definitely our camera systems, right? And so, yeah. um, you know, um, do you think that our industry will go there alone and try to get itself, get its cyber maturity, its cyber hygiene for its products, um, you know, rated, get them better? Uh, maybe not all the products, but give me some I can use for DOD and for critical infrastructure and things like that. Um, or do you think it's going to, again, they're going to wait around for regulation to just push them into it? Well, here I think is the unique challenge on the security, the physical security side. As we talked about, you already have trust. You are, already have a good amount of trust with your customers, with the, the, the market space and the industries. And so when a security company goes and installs a, a, a surveillance system, there is a lot of trust and there's a lot of belief that they're doing it right, it works, it's secure. But the question is, is it really? Is yeah. it really secure once they've put it on the network or it's the, the data feed is going to a managed security service, right? Maybe, maybe not. So yeah. right now we're in this window of customers still trusting the, the physical security space because they've earned it. They've absolutely earned it. However, as we move into the next phase and there become potentially data breaches and all sorts of other problems, that trust may start a road and questions are going to start to arise. And it's only when the customers start demanding and saying, hey, we want these features. Tell me that it's, tell me the security features. Tell me how it handles data. Tell me what uh, certifications it has, what standards it meets. Only then is there really that economic incentive to go down that path. So I think there are going to be some security companies, physical security companies and product companies that are forward thinking, that take the initiative in preparation for this. But I think that the vast majority, given the margins within the physical security market, are probably going to lag behind. Mm. And until there is that clear financial uh, requirement from a competitive perspective, they're not going to be an early adopter. They're not going to move fast. Yeah, I'm hoping that, um, you know, in the DOD space, we've got this uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification coming out in the supply chain this year. And that's more of an internal thing, but I'm hoping that that's a sort of a window at what they'll be doing with our products soon enough. You know, there's, um, it's finally, we're getting measured. We're finally going to be getting audited. And I think once that audit just gets extended a little bit to the products that we're installing, maybe the manufacturers will come in a flood. Because I know it's quite expensive to have these products certified. And we've seen a few now building trusted platform modules in. Uh, they've got, um, you know, uh, certificates available for those that, you, that are uh, trusted. So, and, you know, as much as so there's problems with certificate trust these days as well, I understand that. But there's, right, yeah. there's you know, there's there's things happening. I hope it, I hope it happens a little bit sooner anyway. You know, we're, um, we're down to about three, three minutes to go here. Um, 
I want to get your final comments. Uh, we talked a little bit about trust, um, talked about the billion, we talked about pervasive surveillance. Maybe um, take, the, take the glasses off for the past and let's look ahead at next, give me the next 24, 36 months. We won't hold you to it. We'll get you back on to, to defend it in a year or so, whatever it takes. Um, what, do you, what do you think um, should be top of mind, maybe one, two, three, sort of, for the physical security industry, the integrators, the manufacturers out there, and maybe even the public who is questioning us yet today or not? I don't know. Well, um, so, so the, the screenshot that we had there with the, with the top seven things, those are really about the future. Okay. Um, and it's actually published out on uh, HelpNet Security, so you can go out there uh, and take a look at that. And, you know, out of all those things, um, you know, the artificial intelligence aspect, it's being mm. heavily used and it will continue to be heavily used in the security space and the, both the, the cyber and the physical and, you know, where they, they intersect. And we need to worry about the ethics. Okay. We need to worry about how it can be used by the bad guys. We are already seeing how it can be used by the good guys, right, in, in tracking uh, nefarious activities and in, in understanding uh, baselines to, to find bad practices. But the bad guys are also using it. Mm. And they tend to be the leader. They've been using it longer than the good guys have. And we're going to see some very innovative attacks. We're going to see innovative attacks that undermine trust. Right. If you look at, for example, forgeries or deep fakes or or things of that sort, I can forge the way you look. I could forge a video of you. I could forge your voice. I can even forge using AI your writing style. Mm. So those kinds of things, mm. right? Uh, and so when we look at credentials and we look at at how physical security uses some of these tools and whether it's worth you know, uh, how it can positively and negatively impact, I think AI is going to be one of the big things that both the good guys and bad guys from a physical security perspective are going to be looking at. And the other thing will be the autonomous, um, you know, connected devices. Mm -hmm. And whether that's mm -hmm. automobiles that drive you, whether that's drones that fly over your head, um, anything that's got control. In, in manufacturing, you've got all these devices that are, that are running and operating and, and so forth all by themselves and making decisions for themselves. They represent a risk. They represent a risk to security. They represent a risk to, to individuals, to, to our data and everything else. And I think it's gonna change some of the concerns and some of the responses. So uh, for example, if you have an autonomous vehicle, no driver, right? And I wanted to create a physical security incident. I could load it with, well, let's be benign. Let's, let's just say some flares or smoke bombs right? Yeah, Stink sure. bombs, if you will, <laughs> and have it drive automatically to my target. Sure. And then, and and then light it up. It? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, how does the security gate stop that vehicle, right? right. If, uh, you know, if it's under control of somebody else or it just pulls up and goes off, right? Yeah. Right near the lobby. You yeah. know, there's little things like that, that mm. we've normally had controls in place. If somebody pulled, you know, had to drive up themselves, they put, you know, the attacker put themselves at risk. They could be identified. They could be arrested mm -hmm. if they're doing graffiti yeah. or whatever. But autonomous vehicles yeah. takes that out of the yeah. Yep. You know, a, a drone a spraying graffiti on sure. walls or a building. Who do you go after? Yeah. There's going to be a lot for us to learn in the coming years. Uh, Matthew, I really appreciate you being on today. It was fun. I hope you have a great holiday season. This is our last show of the year. Uh, we'll be back in January with Security Matters, so come back and join us. And Matthew, I hope to get you back on here for an update at some point. Absolutely. Would All love right. to. Take care, man. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. Aloha.